But someone would have talked, say the self-styled skeptics that believe the government's official conspiracy theory of 9-11. After all, every major conspiracy has its whistleblowers, doesn't it? But there's a problem with this logically fallacious non-argument. Someone did talk. In fact, numerous people have come out to blow the whistle on the events of September 11, 2001, and the cover-up that surrounds those events. These are the stories of the 9-11 whistleblowers. You are tuned in to The Corbett Report. In 2001, Kevin Ryan was the site manager at Environmental Health Laboratories, EHL, in South Bend, Indiana. At the time, EHL was a subsidiary of Underwriters Laboratories, UL, a global safety consulting and certification corporation that tests a range of consumer and industrial products for compliance with government safety standards. Among many other things, UL provides fire resistance ratings for structural steel components to ensure compliance with New York City building codes. Just weeks after the events of September 11, 2001, UL's then-CEO, Loring Knobloch, visited Ryan's EHL lab in South Bend. During his speech there, Knobloch assured the lab's workers that UL had certified the steel in the World Trade Center buildings, and that we should all be proud that the buildings had stood for so long under such intense conditions. Knowing UL's role in producing a fire resistance directory and providing ratings for steel components, Ryan thought little of the statement at the time. But Ryan's curiosity about UL's role in the certification of the World Trade Center steel was piqued when, in 2003, he began to question the lies that the Bush administration had used to justify the invasion of Iraq and, eventually, to question the official story of September 11th itself. Recalling Knobloch's comments about UL's role in certifying the Trade Center steel shortly after 9-11, Ryan began to take a professional interest in the official investigation into the Twin Towers' destruction. An investigation in which UL itself was to play a part. As Ryan began to learn more about the issues involved with the destruction of the towers and the ongoing investigation into that destruction, his concerns only grew. Why had the actual steel evidence of the towers' destruction been illegally removed and disposed of before a proper investigation could take place? Why did not one or two, but three modern steel frame buildings completely collapse due to fire on 9-11, given that such an event had never taken place before? Why did the towers fail at all when John Skilling, the structural engineer responsible for designing the towers, claimed in 1993, just five years before his death, that his own analysis of jet plane crashes and ensuing fires in the towers had concluded that the building's structure would still be there? And why had Knobloch himself bragged about UL's role in testing the Trade Center steel, a test that would have rated the floor components for two hours of fire resistance and the building columns for three hours, when the North Tower failed in 102 minutes, and the South Tower came down in just 56 minutes? These concerns prompted Ryan, in October 2003, to write directly to Loring Knobloch, outlining his thoughts and asking what Knobloch was doing to protect our reputation. But if Ryan was expecting Knobloch to put his mind at ease about these issues, he was sorely disappointed. Instead, Knobloch, who included Tom Chapin, then the head of UL's Fire Resistance Division in the email chain, wrote a response that only raised more questions than it answered. Knobloch copied Tom Chapin on his response to me because it was Tom's job as the leader of the fire resistance division to really address these kinds of things. And um, interestingly, Tom Chapin had written an editorial le a letter to the editors of the New York Times in 2002, where he basically admitted again that UL's uh, testing had been behind the fire resistance uh, of the World Trade Center towers. And so I've written about that a little bit. Um, but he, he was very clear uh, that uh, the World Trade Center stood for as long as it did because of UL's testing. And the problem, of course, with that is that the, the South Tower lasted for only 56 minutes after 
after it was hit. And the, the testing that was required by New York City code was three hours of fire resistance for the columns and two hours for the floor assemblies. So 56 minutes and, and those ratings do not add up. That's, that's just not something that should go on question. So Loring Knobloch wrote back to me after my questions and in, in, uh, it must have been October 2003 when I wrote to him. And he wrote back to me a month later. He said all these things about how the company had tested the steel uh, components used to build the World Trade Center towers. What he meant is he, we had tested samples of those and provided ratings for fire resistance to the New York City code. Again, three hours for columns and two hours for floor assemblies. And, and that information established the confidence that the, the buildings would stand in those kinds of fire, uh, those fire durations. And uh, the test that was used was ASTM E119, which is a standard test, the standard test used for this purpose. And um, UL is the leader in doing, doing that testing. So it wasn't a surprise. And uh, not only that, but NIST, the NIST gov government agency, NIST, had, had made clear in some of their progress reports that UL had consulted with the uh, construction companies for the World Trade Center towers. And throughout the building of the buildings, that UL had provided that information. So it's really not a surprise at all. Um, and Tom Chapman replied further to me uh, that, you know, the NIST agency was doing an investigation and asked me basically to kind of have patience. And, and uh, I did for maybe the next year. In 2002, NIST began its three-year, $16 million study of the Twin Towers' failure. Tom Chapin had assured Ryan that UL was cooperating with this investigation and that his concerns would be allayed once the final report was released. But by 2004, it was already clear that there were serious problems with that report and its preliminary findings, including findings from tests conducted by UL on mock-ups of the WTC floor assemblies that contradicted NIST's own conclusions about the building's destruction. Well, it's, it's very important to understand that with um, the official accounts for the World Trade Center, there were a number of um, explanations given uh, in the early years. And for the towers, the one that was settled upon and that um, lasted for three years was the pancake theory. And the pancake theory was this concept where the floor assemblies had heated up and sagged and the, the, the steel had softened or weakened and then they started to collapse upon each other in a pancake st uh, fashion. And then the, the columns basically then just folded inward. So that was the official account, uh, really. It was given by the FEMA investigators, Corley and Thornton and others, who uh, coincidentally had also given us the official account for the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, but in this video from uh, the television program Nova, it was captured uh, for everyone's benefit in little uh, videos, uh, animations. And so the pancake theory was the official account. And UL tested the floor assemblies basically for the possibility of this uh, in August 2004. So this was, again, nine months or ten months after I had asked my original questions. Um, and they did so by using uh, different assemblies with varying amounts of fireproofing. One of the assemblies had basically no fireproofing on it at all. And they ran it through this furnace in this ASTM E119 test and concluded in the end uh, that there would be no collapse, that the floors would not collapse, even in, in temper at temperatures and times greater than what we're seeing at the World Trade Center. And they made that clear, NIST made this clear, that the pancake theory was not supported. So that left us all at that time with no explanation in 2004, three years later, having invaded Iraq, having, having done so much uh, to invest in the official account that the World Trade Center had been destroyed by these planes, uh, and that was a difficult situation for NIST and for everyone. 
Realizing that UL was not pressing NIST on the discrepancies in its findings, Kevin Ryan took matters into his own hands and, on November 11, 2004, wrote directly to Frank Gale, the director of NIST's Twin Towers investigation. That email began, As I'm sure you know, the company I work for certified the steel components used in the construction of the WTC buildings. In requesting information from both our CEO and fire protection business manager last year, I learned that they did not agree on the essential aspects of the story, except for one thing, that the samples we certified met all requirements. They suggested we all be patient and understand that UL was working with your team and that tests would continue through this year. I'm aware of UL's attempts to help, including performing tests on models of the floor assemblies, but the results of these tests appear to indicate that the building should have easily withstood the thermal stress caused by pools of burning jet fuel. After pointing out the problems raised by NIST's own investigation, including the tests that disproved claims that the steel in the floor area simply melted, Ryan got to the heart of the matter. This story just does not add up. If steel from those buildings did soften or melt, I'm sure we can all agree that this was certainly not due to jet fuel fires of any kind, let alone the briefly burning fires in those towers. That fact should be of great concern to all Americans. Alternatively, the contention that this steel did fail at temperatures around 250 degrees Celsius suggests that the majority of deaths on 9-11 were due to a safety-related failure. That suggestion should be of great concern to my company. There is no question that the events of 9-11 are the emotional driving force behind the war on terror. And the issue of the WTC collapse is at the crux of the story of 9-11. My feeling is that your metallurgical tests are the crux of the crux of the crux. Either you can make sense of what really happened to those buildings and communicate this quickly, or we all face the same destruction and despair that come from global decisions based on disinformation and chatter. Predictably, if unfortunately, Gale never responded to the email. However, Ryan made the important decision to share the email and his concerns with the broader public. Uh, Frank did not respond. No. Uh, actually, that uh, letter was sent to him and then also copied to uh, a couple of people who were trying to find more information, trying to find the truth about what happened uh on 9-11. And those two included David Griffin, who had just recently written a book, and Catherine Austin Fitz, the director of 911truth.org. Dr. Griffin asked me almost immediately if he could share it publicly. And uh, um, of course, uh, with some hesitation, but knowing the importance and believing what I wrote, I told him it was okay. And uh, Overnight, there must have been tens of thousands of people reading this letter on the web and uh, people calling our offices in South Bend at UL constantly and uh, calling me at home constantly. Uh, so I um, was, I think a lot of people were feeling the same. They were thinking the same thing um, that clearly there was something wrong here and uh, the story was not explaining what we needed to know. So uh, Dr. Gale did not respond. He's never responded. Maybe one day I will uh, talk to him personally and find out what he thinks. But, uh, you know, these things are clear um, in terms of job. This is it's not really a uh, just a career decision, although it is. It's a career decision. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's more of that. More than that, it's a decision about, you know, what kind of world we want to live in. And at a time where that kind of decision is really important because, you know, the, the book 1984 was supposed to be a, a fiction and it's evolving into reality. Ryan did not engage in these actions naively. He knew that allowing his concerns to go public would focus public attention on himself and on UL, and that such actions would have ramifications for his employment. But if he was bracing for those ramifications, he didn't have long to wait. 
His email to Frank Gale was sent on Thursday, November 11, 2004. It was published on the web the following day. Immediately, Ryan's phone was ringing off the hook and UL was being contacted for comment. That weekend, the company reached out to him to let him know the consequences of his actions. The human resources folks called me that weekend and asked if I would contact the people on the web who had published it and asked that it be taken down. And I refused to do that and told them that I didn't think that was the right thing to do. And I think it was at that very point then they started making the plans to uh, to terminate me. So um, I had uh, actually taken the following, the next Monday off of work and it was, it was convenient, but uh, it allowed me to kind of get my thoughts together. And then on Tuesday when I came in, which I believe was the 16th, um, the leaders from uh, the Northbrook Chicago office were there and uh, they had told me they would be please make sure you're there you know <laughs> they brought a letter on ul letterhead and made it clear that uh, you know I, they felt that i had practiced poor judgment in writing this letter and sending it to their client nist it had harmed their relationship with nist and uh and thereby i was terminated so uh yeah, so that was a tough spot for my family and I, and uh, uh, but my wife uh, has been supportive. She she kind of knows the idealistic nature of, of her husband, I think, and uh, she knew why it was important. And uh, we've done fine. We've we've gotten by and gotten other jobs, and and that's I believe people should recognize that you know that it's not the end of the world to lose your job. Sometimes it's it's a new beginning that is useful. Not for courting controversy, but merely for pointing out the glaring truth, Ryan was fired from his job. Like so many other whistleblowers in so many other stories, Ryan paid a price for doing what his conscience demanded. Also like many other brave men and women who have been thrust into the position of blowing the whistle, Ryan has found a way to thrive despite the setbacks. Rather than keeping quiet and moving on with his life, Ryan has doubled down on his efforts, founding several action groups, editing the Journal of 9-11 Studies, writing articles and books on the subject of 9-11, volunteering on the board of directors of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, delivering lectures on the destruction of the World Trade Center, and continuing to raise public awareness of the problems with the official story of the founding event of the War on Terror. In the end, Despite the high price he paid career-wise, Ryan feels that his decision to blow the whistle and call out the self-contradictions of the NIST investigation was worth it. After all, it is only when those who know the truth are unafraid to step up and speak it, regardless of the personal consequences, that we will ever hope to achieve true justice. What I've been able to benefit from is understanding a lot more about society, history, politics, uh, being better at communicating myself. And uh, I've met a lot of great people. We've worked together to raise awareness and try to bring justice for 9-11. Uh, you know, I've, I've met uh, and presented with 9-11 victims, family members. I've met 9-11 commission leaders um, and, and other people who uh, were very central to this story. I've so many great researchers, so many uh, great people. So overall, it was definitely worth it for me. Uh, it's a personal decision, of course, and uh, it has to be motivated by trying to do some good. If it's not motivated by trying to do some good, then you're doing the wrong thing. We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. What you were doing in Saudi Arabia was issuing visas to the Mujahideen. We thought we were set up to fail. 